and Donnie wanted to be here. I'll take a picture then. Okay. Everyone has a life story. However, a testimony is a bit different. It's still a life story, but it's where God is at the beginning, middle, and end. <clears throat> my life story is about how God, the creator of all, orchestrated my life by his sovereign plan, how he revealed himself to me and drew my heart, showing me that I was a sinner and needed a savior. So let me start at the beginning. God created me quite to the surprise of my parents. My mom found out she was expecting me shortly before delivering me. I was three months premature and weighed two pounds, 11 ounces, and 14 inches long. My first claim to fame is that the Kennedys had a baby boy who was born five months before I was. Thank you. My first claim to fame is that the Kennedys had a baby boy who was born five months before I was born but sadly, he didn't survive despite the use of an incubator called the Isolette. I was the first baby to survive in that incubator. However, the real claim to fame is that God created me according to his word in Psalm 139. He formed my inward parts and knitted me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He gave me life and has sustained it by his grace and mercy. We were a family of three boys and three girls that stair stepped down from the ages of 14 down to seven. And then there was me, the baby. All eight of us lived in a tiny three bedroom house in Sanford, Florida. It's, it sounds like we were the perfect Brady Bunch family. However, we were anything but that. Let me rewind a bit. The truth is our family is made up of six kids, three dads, one mom. What a mess. It's kind of like saying, who's your daddy and are you sure? We've had some surprises. Enter in alcoholism, domestic violence, and abuse. Furthermore, enter in police, divorce, and a family completely torn apart. Yeah, that's who we really were. At age four, my parents split up. It split all of us kids up as well. We never lived together again as a family. Two of my siblings and I went with my mom, but it wasn't long before we were torn apart as well. Then it was just me and my mom with my sister Danny popping in and out occasionally, as she does. <laughs> and the nightmare began. Things got progressively worse. Her drinking, neglect, and abuse were bad. Just really bad. Lots and lots of things happened that year. I became a very frightened child, yet I, I was also like the little adult as well. There's so much I could say, but that's in the long version. Here's a quick rundown of that year. <clears throat> Alone with my mom, I hung out in bars with her regularly. We had many men in and out of our apartment with me having to kick them out at times in the middle of the night. We often slept at various locations, hotels, friends' houses, and even down on the beach. Sometimes she would keep me up all night just calling my name over and over again. I don't know how I ever made it to school. Many bad things happened. One night, my mom woke me up and told me I had to walk to someone's house because the police were coming. I was so scared walking on what's a normally busy street by myself in the middle of the night at five years old. I finally made it to the corner and there was a strange man standing there. I asked him if he would walk me to these people's house. He took me by the hand and he did. It could have ended so differently. God protected me. Yeah. Another time after an evening of them drinking, a guy was messing with his gun. I was standing in front of him watching the next thing I knew, there was a gunshot. He accidentally shot himself. That could have been me. Thank you, God, for protecting me. My mom's life was one drunken episode after another to the detriment of her kids, her family, and her life. She'd sleep for days, so I would just take care of myself. Once when I was hungry, I sat on the counter and taught myself how to use a toaster making toast. When the bread got stuck, in went the buttery knife to retrieve it. God protected me time and time again. That year I was hospitalized twice and twice I was abandoned. The first time she took me and dropped me off to have my tonsils taken out the next day. No mom around, into surgery alone, recovery alone, and I was there left long enough to start running the halls. My sister, Danny, thir 13 at the time, eventually came and kidnapped me. We went down the stairs and onto a bus. This would never happen today. The second time I was pretty sick. I had a very high fever, throwing up, and then I started having seizures. They did a spinal tap and I was diagnosed with epilepsy. My mom was never there. 
I was put on phenobarbital and had EEGs every six months for the next six years. I do believe that God has healed me. I lived with my mom from one drunken episode to another. I lived scared all the time. She was abusive and I learned to duck, run, or hit back. So one night, so one night, some really bad things happened and the police were called. My mom was taken to jail and I was taken to my first foster home. I was so scared. It's just not right seeing your mom behind bars. I remember just trembling in the police car, but I never cried. Foster homes, I hated them all. They were terrible. The weirdest thing, the adults never talked to me that first night, nor did they in any of the other foster homes. They acted as if I was invisible. No one ever told me what was going to happen. No one asked me how I was feeling and no, or what I thought, and no one ever told me I was gonna be okay. I just became one of the kids. I was scared, but I never cried. Due to a glitch in the system, I eventually went back to my mom, back to the abuse and neglect. Then a cycle of me being taken away and going from home to home began. Here's a quick rundown. Over the next few years, I lived with various neighbors, friends, and various aunts and uncles, and always back to my mom in between. A child always wants their mom, despite how bad things are. By sixth grade, I was beginning to get a bit rebellious. I had started smoking at the age of nine and got drunk my first time at the age of 10. I began lying a lot and I was very mischievous. I started fighting back with my mom. Despite my behavior, I knew I shouldn't be there. So I called the police and had myself taken away. So the moving began once again. I was sent to live with my sister Donna and her growing family for the next four months. Up to this point, I had been raised Catholic. My mom always made me go alone, which I did not like. So at one point, I tried to say that I was an atheist, but I was too scared to not believe in God. I thank God for that fear. God began drawing my heart. My sister Donna was a new believer, and she shared with me that I was a sinner in need of a savior. She walked me through confessing that I was a sinner and asking for forgiveness. I did, and in some ways I felt as if a big burden had been lifted off of me. Was it a checklist or was it real? I don't know, but it felt good. Before I knew much about what I experienced and what it all meant, I was on the move again. So over the next year, I was sent to my father, who I barely knew, then to his sisters, and then to another aunt and uncle. By the end of seventh grade, I decided I wanted to go back to my mom. Sadly, she was hospitalized when we got there, and it was decided that I couldn't stay. I left my mom's hospital room and heard them tell her that I wasn't staying. Hearing my mom cry broke my heart, but I never cried, and I never saw my mom again. Now, where was I going to live since I had lived with almost every relative? Was I really that bad that no one wanted me? I was sent to live with my brother, which lasted two months, and then I was sent to my mom's first ex-husband and family. Weird, huh? Let's just say it didn't go well and there was much tension between me and the wife. Then one night I got the phone call that my mom died of cirrhosis of liver at the age of 49, just a few weeks after my 15th birthday. I never felt more alone as I did at that moment. One of the first things I said was, what am I going to do now? I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. I was denied all emotions. I couldn't go to her funeral, and I was expected to go on as if nothing ever happened. My heart was hurting, but I had no one there that I trusted with my emotions, so I shoved them way deep down inside. I began to get very hard. I didn't care anymore. I was ready to just leave. But God brought back to mind what I had prayed. I began wanting to know the scriptures that had been shared with me. There was no internet, so I would write Donna and ask her about them. I began questioning things in the Catholic Church because of an incident which did not go well, well with the wife. So I was told to pack up and out I went. Was I really that bad? I had nowhere else to go, so I was sent back to Florida with my sister Donna. I wanted to be 18 and on my own, which I did at 17, but God had a plan. I went to church, but I was a religious Sunday Christian, partying when I could. Then God gave me the love of my life, my bestest Alan. We got married in 1985, and God blessed us with our firstborn right away. We went to church, but it was legalistic and hyper-crazy. 
My mind was so confused, thinking that I just didn't get it. I believed that my faith wasn't good enough. My God was a scary, angry God. I had placed him far away from me. In my heart, I felt like I had prayed the prayer. I went to church, and we were good. I was safe, but God, you stay there, and I'll stay here. I knew how to walk the walk and talk the talk, but I didn't have a real relationship with God. God grew our family and blessed us with three more kids. Fast forward, eventually God brought us, brought Alan and I to Trinity. Walking in was scary and the back row was our friend. However, I felt such love and the only way to describe it, it was all about the heart. I thought I knew so much, but quickly realized that I only knew religion and did not know my savior. I lived my life with much fear and performance, always trying to be all put together as I'm doing now. Um, Tim began teaching through the book of Mark. Week after week, I sat soaking it all in. I heard things I had never heard before, like sovereignty and grace. I saw sin and the effects of sin, but over and over again, I saw his mercy and grace displayed. One Sunday morning, by the grace of God, and through the Holy Spirit, it all clicked. I got it. The gospel was coming alive to me. I saw how bad sin is and how good the good news is. I understood his sovereignty and what faith really is. It's about him, not me. He chose me and he called me. He sovereignly orchestrated my life, brought me to himself, and poured out his mercy and grace on me. The God who I had placed far away from me had sent his son to die for my sins. The words amazing grace are just not words. I got it. My heart was so full. I had all these feelings and emotions that I wasn't used to. My heart was softening. My passion for Jesus soared. In Mark 15, it says, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. No longer was my God scary and far away. I became aware of his amazing grace and realized that there was no longer a division between us. My Savior, Jesus Christ, loved me. Me, who never thought I was loved by anyone, was loved by God. Jesus loves me. He died for my sins. He, the sinless Savior, bore the wrath of God that I deserved. What a Savior. Thank you, Jesus.